Colin Kaminsky joins me this week to discuss process control for the brewer. This is Beer Smith Podcast number 269. This is Beersmith Podcast number 269, and it's early November 2022. Colin Kaminsky joins me this week to discuss process, process control for the home brewer. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Thinking about opening your own brewery? Craft Beer and Brewing is sponsoring a brewery workshop at Fort Collins, Colorado, where you can connect with experts who have built successful breweries. The workshop runs from 26 February to 1 March 2023, and it's your opportunity to learn from the pros. For more information, visit breweryworkshop.com. Again, that's breweryworkshop.com. And also the Brew Commander, the brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent pending Brew Commander is a high quality brew house controller that offers automated step mashing, boil timers, precision temperature control, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with a new Brew Commander. To order yours today, visit blickmanengineering.com. Again, that's blickmanengineering.com. And I launched a new version of the Beersmith Forum a few weeks ago, as well as made some significant security upgrades. The Beersmith Discussion Forum is a place where you can discuss all things brewing, including techniques, ingredients, equipment, pro brewing, and our Beersmith recipe software. Join in the conversation today at beersmith.com slash forum. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome back Colin Kaminsky. Colin has been brewing beer professionally and designing brewing equipment since 1998. He's the co-author of The Water Book, uh, a comprehensive guide for brewers, as well as many BYO articles. Uh, Colin, it's great to have you on the show. How are you doing? Um, I'm doing good. It's wonderful to be back on the show. Yeah, I looked in the archives and uh, you started way, like, I had you on first time way back in December of 2013. Uh, that, you were that's co- right, when The Water Book came out. Yeah, you were working with John Palmer. Uh, you were both on at the same time. Um, as I understand it, though, you you shifted over from brewing, and you're actually doing something uh, entirely different now with More Beer, right? Yeah, I uh, work in the R&D department at More Beer, um, design everything from small fittings to large tanks. Um, uh, really enjoy what I do, get a lot of chance to uh, uh, work with customers, uh, try to find new products that fit their needs, get a chance to branch into the home brewing side um, and assist with the brew built product line and and some of our other product lines that we have. And you're working uh, more on the professional side now, right? I think, aren't you? Yeah, I do mostly the professional stuff. So tri-clover fittings, um, pro brewing tanks, um, mm-hmm. uh, some of the, the pro brewing systems. Just recently did a, um, a seven barrel still. A seven barrel still, yeah. Is, uh, mm-hmm. is, that, is that a big thing now? Are the, are the, uh, is distilling starting to take off a little bit? You know, it's still pretty small, but we figured it was better to get in early than than to wait and uh, till the waves at the peak. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some interesting laws here in California that um, uh, allow you to give you a lot of privileges if you have a small distillery. So mm-hmm. it allows you to run a bar if you have food, allows you to buy from a distributor, sell to a distributor, um, blend. Uh, uh, instead of having to distill all your own, you can buy alcohol and blend it. Oh, cool. Um, and and it basically gives you more privileges than any other license, but it caps how much you can produce. And we're only, we only have about 100 of those in California now, um, but we really see it as the next big wave in California. Um, today, you wanted to talk about process control and its effect on beer. Uh, obviously, very, very important topic for, for pro brewers. Um, can, you, can you just introduce the whole idea of process control and, and why it's so important in brewing? Well, you know, the whole idea for uh, this particular uh, uh, talk was uh, came from a Facebook post where um, somebody was saying, you know, in in uh, when you talk to home brewers, they're talking all about recipe, and when you talk to pro brewers, they're t- all talking about process. And uh, kind of wanted to go into to why why we really get to the point where process is more important than recipe. Uh, in pro brewing and why it should be more important to to home brewers. Hmm. Um, the the recipe, you know, sounds really important until you make the same recipe about a hundred times, then you realize that everything you do in the brew house changes the recipe. And it's really hard to make the same recipe a few times 
um, uh, consistently. Uh, and, you know, you, you might make a small change in your recipe and think, oh, that made a big change in the beer, when really what you did was unknowingly change the process, and the process had an influence on the beer. And until you can really dial your process in tight, you don't really know if it's the process or if it's a recipe. And I mean, I, to, to be honest, most of us don't spend a lot of time on thinking about process control, really. I mean, we certainly I, focus a little bit on the brewing process itself and, and you know, maybe trying to make our equipment a little better or whatever. Um, but, uh, but certainly not the, the effort that the, the professional brewers put into it. Well, and, and, you know, that's gotten a lot easier since I started brewing. I mean, when I started brewing at the homebrew level, you never even had control over your hot liquor temperature. You kind of ran it up, you know, full burner up until your thermometer said it was about where you thought it was. And then you kind of put the flame on low and you crashed ahead and didn't really pay a lot of attention and didn't really have time to pay attention. You were busy mashing in and doing other stuff um, because there weren't even temperature controlled hot liquor tanks at that point. And, uh, I remember when I made the first one for more beer, everybody was like, a home brewer is never going to want to pay, you know, an extra $125 to have a temperature controlled hot liquor. And it's like, well, I want it on my system, so I'm going to make it. Hmm. And it turns out now everybody has it, right? It's yeah, yeah. I, you know, I can't imagine brewing without it, um, and I couldn't then. Um, and a lot of that uh, pro brewing stuff has crept down. A lot of it I brought, I brought in uh, uh, between '98 and 2003 when I was at More Beer the first time, and then when I stopped bringing it in, um, uh, just a huge amount of people just started going, "Oh well, what if we take this in? What if we take that in?" And home brewing's really come just so far since '98. Yeah, you know, it's it's not it's not um, hot pans on your stove to get hot water, mashing in a bucket and pouring into a boil kettle anymore. No, you know, I mean it, a lot of us are getting uh, very close to professional level systems in our house. Certainly, <laughs> yeah, certainly the systems from Spike and from More Beer and um, uh, the brew built system uh, that we do. Um, uh, the the SS BrewTech system, I mean, yeah. they're just amazing. They're you know they're 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 remarkable systems, and and there was nothing like that in '98 when I started brewing. It was you know a couple of three tier gravity systems made out of kegs um, that you could find, but mm -hmm. uh, as far as these dedicated systems with with process control, you didn't have it. Well, I was hoping to walk through the brewing process and maybe you could talk a little bit about how uh, process control feeds into each of these. And I, I figured we'd probably start with water uh, since you wrote the work, you know, you, you wrote the book <laughs> on water uh, with John Palmer. Uh, maybe you could talk for a minute about, you know, how your views on water have evolved uh, over the last few years and, and things like residual alkalinity and so on. Well, you know, so originally my understanding of water came from trying to control the process better. I was getting um, inconsistent results um, from running the exact same recipe. And what I was finding was that my, my water supply was changing on a day to day basis. And when you've got a changing water supply, um, you've got to try to grab that and, and make it more consistent. Homebrewers now, um, a lot of them use RO and build water from scratch. Um, in which case residual alkalinity is not important at all um, or, or nowhere near as important. But when you're, when one day your residual alkalinity, you know, is, is 30 and the next day it's minus 30, um, it's a huge problem. Hmm. Um, and, and so calculating the residual alkalinity and then trying to make adjustments to, to make it the same was, was the first step in having consistent mass pH. Now, was your, and, uh, was your water supply just inconsistent? Is that due to the, the way California pulls it from different sources or what? Yeah, so for me, I had, uh, I had two problems. I had three different places that the water would come from. One was very soft. Um, one was um, fairly consistent, um, but had a lot more alkalinity in it. And then the other one was um, kind of like the emergency thing that we went to uh, January, February, and it was hugely inconsistent. It would depend on how much was raining. It would depend on what decisions they were making in the water treatment facility. Um, 
they they were making decisions not based on what was best for the brew house. They were making decisions because right above the water inlet was a little depression that had a bunch of cattle in it. Hmm. And that depression um, would obviously, you know, just be filled with cow poop all year. And then we'd get a really heavy rain and it would wash it right into the inlet. Oh, nice. And then, right. And then suddenly, you know, they would have this huge uh, uh, demand to, the, this huge need to uh, add tons and tons of chlorine. Huh. So so all of this was was changing on me all the time. And for the first couple of years I brewed, I, I just didn't really understand how important it really was to keep my water consistent for each recipe. Um and as I started running into A.J. DeLang's work and, and Martin Brungard's work and, and, and figuring this stuff out, you know, they were, they were doing this stuff long before I even thought about it mm-hmm. and uh, uh, started working th- this stuff out. Um, residual alkalinity became the first step into controlling my water. Then the next step to controlling my water was understanding how sulfate and chloride was affecting my hop character because mm-hmm. I was making very hoppy ales. Um, and then the final thing that, that didn't come until after we wrote the water book was understanding how important it was to uh, drive off all the oxygen and all the CO2 out of my water before I used it. Interesting. Um, in, in small uh, brewing systems, you don't really worry about the accumulation of CO2 in your liquor. Um, and just heating it up is probably enough to drive out enough oxygen that you don't worry about it. But in a big tank, you, you can run into um, lots of dissolved gases and they can be super saturated. Um, I think w- one of the things that always bothered me was I would be adding brewing salts to the hot liquor tank and it would instantly just start to foam and, hmm. and, and didn't make any sense why that was happening. It, it, would, it would just get a huge amount of bubbles like you just cracked open a, um, a bottle of water. And it turned out that... Um, um, I just had all the all these dissolved gases from filling the kettle and heating it up. So they were dissolved and at equilibrium cold. But once I heated it up, they were super saturated. Once I gave them the salts as nucleation sites, they were coming out of solution. So, so I mean, do you have any tips for homebrewers that, that, that may have that issue? I mean, certainly, you know, most of us or a lot of us fill, you know, from a kitchen sink or something with an aerator on it. So, I mean, you're really introducing oxygen right into the water right before you brew with it. And, and certainly uh, heating it up and holding it at temperature um, works out really well. Um, uh, the higher you take that temperature, um, uh, you know, there, a lot of people pre-boil their water for other reasons, but pre-boiling is good for dissolved gases. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to run it up to 211. I don't want it to boil. I like to pull it up all the way to 211 and then let it sit and cool uh, on okay. the homebrew level. And that's enough for me to drive out the gases. So you, you do that before you mash in, I guess, uh... Yeah, so often what I'll do is I'll do I'll I I brew my homebrew setup is electric, mm-hmm. so it takes a long time for the water to heat, and I have that set on a timer. So the day I fill my hot liquor, I'll run it up to two eleven and then let it cool, and then at about four in the morning the next day or or a few days later, my burner will come on and and run me up to one hundred and sixty five, um, which is the temperature I like to to have my hot liquor for mashing. So, I mean, other than the CO2 and the oxygen issue, have you, you know, have your, have your uh, views on water evolved in any other ways since you wrote the book? I, I think I'm a lot more playful with water now. Um, uh, I think that's something that I've learned from the, uh, the hazy IPA guys is they're doing things with water that I would have told you 15 years ago were just wrong. That, uh-huh. that there's just no way to make a good tasting beer with what you're doing, and they are, and and they're being they're 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 controlling their their pH correctly, and then and then doing very interesting things with with what John likes to call the flavor ions, um, uh, to bring flavors out of of the malt and the hops that that I didn't think we would like. I didn't think we could balance. I didn't mm. think we could make work. And they're doing it. And and it's, it's kind of shattered some soft rules that I had. They weren't hard rules, but they were soft rules that I had for how to make a, a good tasting beer. And and I, I, that has been a lot of fun and a lot a lot more playful. You know, running a, a, a beer with a little bit higher pH uh, than I normally would and a lot of chlorides 
um, to make an IPA um, was a little bit uh, scary at first, but uh, I'm finding that it's 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 really fun and it's really useful. So it's interesting. I, I actually got that question the other day. Uh, somebody posted, I think, on the forum asking, you know, what's the best water profile for a hazy IPA? And I, I didn't really have a good answer. I know it. I know it's not the same as a regular IPA, um, and it's not a style I personally brew a lot, but um, you know, what kind of a water profile would you recommend for a hazy IPA? Well, so I'm not a hazy IPA expert either. Um, uh -huh. I've made a I've made a couple of recipes. I probably have done 25 or 30 batches of of two recipes. Um, uh, and still, when I go to to Vermont um, or Connecticut, I learn things about the style, right? Um, uh, and and I, I find that that to be really fascinating. That that style really is East Coast driven. Um, what we're doing out here on the West Coast is copying it the best we can. Um, but I still look at Vermont as being a leader in the style. Uh, what I'm seeing from their beers is um, uh, the mash pH is they're running um, higher than I normally would. So instead mm -hmm. of uh, 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 instead of running you know um, four three. Um, I might run a West Coast IPA. Um, they're running 4.4, maybe even a little higher, 4.45. 4, 4, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't have any firsthand knowledge of this. I, I assume you mean 5.4, five, five right? I'm sorry, 5.4. Yeah. Uh, yeah, not 4.4 four four would be very, very low. Yeah, yeah. You'd be making I, something, thinking, almost a sour I'm, beer. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking Finnish beer pHs, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and and that's really what I'm going on is what what does the finished beer pH where I like a, a finished beer pH on a West Coast IPA to be four two, mm -hmm. um, the, these are tasting um, higher pH to me. Um, yeah, I just I just one, want to mention for people that those are after fermentation, not not the mash pH because right right. If you start but, with a mash pH of four two, start. you're probably going to be way in the way you're, you know, gonna, you're gonna make a sour beer almost at the end, right? Yeah, thank yeah. you for catching me. That. Yeah, because <laughs> the, the the you know the pH drops quite a bit during fermentation. Um, well, yeah, the, the next, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. And, and the pH doesn't drop as, cons as pH, it, it, the yeast isn't as good as a, a buffer as I once thought, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting. So if you start with a mash pH of, of five, four and, 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 or five, five, four, five, and you don't drop it in the kettle of which you can, you can actually add calcium to the kettle sure. and drop the pH during boil. Um, uh, when you go to ferment, it's not going to pull down to 4.2 um, like I'm expecting a West Coast IPA to drop down. Mm -hmm. And it will end up at 4.4 at four, four, or even 4.5. Um, In which a finished is, beer, yeah. Yeah, if you would have asked me, if you would have asked me uh, 15 years ago if if that was how it worked, I, I actually would have said the yeast was going to buffer it down to 4.2. Mm -hmm. um, but but I'm finding that it doesn't. And, and these these East Coast IPAs, the hazy IPAs, um, we're seeing them uh, uh, not as acidic as the West Coast uh, IPAs are. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the next step in brewing is, of course, mashing. And we already talked a little bit about mash pH, but what, what factors are most important to control uh, during the mash from a process control perspective? I'm, I'm really enjoying the malt characters that are coming out of this uh, low oxygen regime that you see people using. Um, and and I'm I'm approaching that um, as as carefully as I can now. So I'm trying to drive oxygen out of my strike water, trying to get as much oxygen out of my my grist as I can. Um, I do that by stirring a lot. Um, I'm adding tannins to my grist. Um, um, uh, there's a tannin that comes from um, burls and trees that I'm adding to try to pull out some more oxygen. Um, uh, I'm, uh, 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 when I'm recirculating, I'm trying to recirculate as gently as possible. Hmm. So I've, I've got a flat plate that sits above my mash and I, I, I drop the water in onto the flat plate. Um, and the flat plate is submerged by a couple inches of, of liquor, hmm. um, just to try to keep the, all of that as, as, um, oxygen free as possible. When I'm, when I'm recirculating, I'm dropping into a grant and my, uh, my, uh, outlet of my grant of my mash ton is below the, the height of the grant so that, that I'm not picking up air there. Hmm. Um, I'm, and you know, hot, hot side aeration has been a big debate. Um, 
uh, in the industry. Yeah. Uh, everybody I know that has to do this uh, for billions of dollars um, controls it very carefully. Yeah. And and when I control it very carefully, I'm finding I like my malts better. Interesting. Um, and 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 really, I I'm finding that uh, the malt character just comes out much much more refined, much more distinctive, um, uh, much less muddled. Um, uh, and so for me, process control is temperature, um, and that is not only hitting my target temperature, but maintaining that temperature throughout the entire mash, right. not having not having the top be one temperature and the bottom be another temperature. So I'm recirculating all the way through my mash now. Yeah, um, we're fortunate a lot of systems could do that now, so it's kind of nice at the home brew level. Yeah, uh, right. My homebrew system is doing that now. I w- I've been doing it pro brewing for 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um uh, but uh, my homebrew system can recirculate the entire mash now, um, uh, and, and I'm running it through a Herm system so I can hold the temperature more stable. Um, in pro brewing, that's not a really big concern for me because, you know, I've uh, I had big two inch thick walls on my mash tun um, that that were insulated, um, but also there's much less surface area to volume in a, in a big mash tun like that. Um, so I, I wasn't losing as much as as you would uh, in the homebrew system. Um, so that, but Herms has fixed that for me, mm-hmm. um, which is another thing that is really common for people now. Yeah. How much? Uh, um, how much do you focus on hydration? Um, is that is that an important factor when you're first mashing in? You know, it it is for me, um, and I think, and I don't know how important it is at the homebrewing. It might almost take care of itself homebrewing because it's so easy to stir a homebrew kettle. On, on a pro system, it's so big and so heavy when you've got 500 pounds of malt that you're you're pushing around and and um, uh, you know you're pushing around probably oh, 700 pounds of water with 500 pounds of malt. Mm-hmm. Um, it physically beats up your body. I was in a very manual system. I was doing this with a canoe paddle, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, so I was paying really close attention to it. And um, so I do homebrewing as well. I don't know if I. I don't know if it's important that I do it or if I just do it. <laughs> um, how much do you focus on mash pH? We already talked a little bit about mash pH and, uh, and, you know, adjusting it a little bit for different styles, but um, you know, is mash I, pH very, very important at the homebrew level or not? I think it's absolutely important. And I, I think for these, uh, especially because it translates all the way down to finished beer um, pHs that, that it's super important. Mm-hmm. Um uh, I, I've always controlled it a little differently than most people. Um, most home brewers will mash in and say, okay, well, I'm at, you know, uh, five, two, and I really wanted to be at five, three. So I'm going to add, uh, you know, whatever they're going to add, uh, they could add potassium um, bicarbonate, so- whatever. potassium bicarbonate, sodium, uh, bicarbonate. Um, I've even seen home brewers add sodium hydroxide or, or potassium hydroxide, hmm. um, uh, which is a really two really dangerous chemicals to yeah, deal with. I was going to say, they, <laughs> but they they change the mash really quickly and really efficiently. Yeah. Um, so in that case, they're they're really useful. If you I mean, in most to cases, I'm trying to get mine down, the pH down, you know. And and if you're doing light beers, that's probably more common than yeah. trying to go up. Um, uh, and and I see that too, where people are putting phosphoric acid or lactic acid in to yeah. try to go down. Um, my opinion's always been that that that's kind of closing the the barn door after the horse got out. Mm-hmm. So what I do is I write down that pH and then I go and I fix my water for the next batch of beer, mm. um, and then run through with whatever pH I got that time, but fix it absolutely fix it for the next batch. Yeah, I mean I've been advocating for some time using a strategy where you maybe use some software to estimate how much uh, acid you might need up front. And add a majority of that up front before you mash in uh, to the water. And then later taking the measurement and making a final adjustment if you need to. Um, you know, and, that, and that's kind of how the wine guys work, right? They, they, they want as much acid added or as early as possible as they can so that they're doing minor additions later on in the process. Um, and, and I think that has a lot of value to, to brewing. Um, and, and the software has really come a long way. You know, the software didn't exist at all, and we were just guessing yeah. uh, 20 years ago. Yeah. And 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 now the, the math I'm seeing is working out really well. 
you know, residual alkalinity was kind of like the initial math, but residual alkalinity doesn't really take into account dark malts. It doesn't take into account caramel malts. And now the softwares really do that well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's still an approximation, but, uh, but certainly much better than we had in the past. Um, well, stepping to the next step, let's uh, let's talk about the boil. Um, you know, a lot of us at the homebrew level don't really pay much attention to the boil, other than just trying to make our make sure our pot doesn't boil over. Uh, but what some what are some of the key aspects of the boil uh, that we want to monitor and control in our process? Well, hopefully everybody's boiling vigorously enough to, to drive off DMS. <coughs> sure. Me. And uh, and having a good rolling boil was something that we were all taught. Um, but calculating the evaporation rate, I think, is absolutely crucial. And um, the difference between a, a 8% evaporation rate and a 10% evaporation rate is a noticeable flavor change. Um, and I don't think homebrewers are really controlling to that level. Um, certainly, a, a homebrewer is going to notice the difference between a 6% evaporation rate, which is probably going to leave DMS behind, and an 18% evaporation rate, which is going to uh, create more melanoidins. Mm -hmm. um, so those are two big flavor extremes. But even in the middle of that, you know, 8%, 10%, 12%, um, if you train your palate, you're going to taste that. And, and so having that uh, good flavor control, um, I think, is part of, of that evaporation rate. And I, I measure evaporation rate, um, pro-brewing and home-brewing with a ruler. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, if you know how deep your kettle is and, and, and what the volume is, you can calculate, oh, well, if I evaporate one inch or if I evaporate three inches, then I've got my process and control here. So do you, so do you um, boil the time or do you just boil the volume, basically? I... I want my evaporation rate to be a certain percentage per hour. Mm -hmm. um, but if I'm boiling too vigorously, which is really easy to do in a homebrew setup, um, I will kill my boil early or I tend to, to pre-boil before I add hops. Mm -hmm. So it gives me some time before I have hops in the, in the play um, to get my evaporation rate dialed in. Um, and then, so let's say I'm doing, a. uh, so, I mean, you're actually, a, I'm sorry, you're actually I, monitoring this as your boy, as you're, I mean, you're monitoring that rate as you're, as you're going. Absolutely. Oh, that's so cool. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, let's say I'm planning a 75 minute boil, which is pretty typical for me. Yeah. I'll calculate that evaporation rate after 15 minutes, right before I'm doing my first top edition. Hmm. Um, and then go, okay, I'm, I'm a little bit too vigorous or I'm not quite vigorous enough and I'll, and then I'll, I'll make an adjustment there. Um, and then all the way at the end of boil, then I do a gravity reading and I do a final adjustment there. So, um, I, I, ideally I'm hoping that I'm adding a little tiny bit of water, um, to get my gravity perfect. Um, but sometimes I'm adding a little tiny bit of, uh, uh, mal maltodextrose. So are you adjusting that rate by just, uh, I, I, just, I guess yeah, dial up the burner. The, yeah, just dialing. Yeah, so on, on the gas systems, I'm dialing up the flame. On a on a electric system, I'm I'm a I have a PID. Yeah. Uh, or it's I'm actually adjusting the duty cycle to the burner. Right. Um, right. I don't quite know how to explain it. Um, so I mean, what rate do you shoot for then? What's a what's a reasonable boil off rate for middle of the road beer? Eight, eight to 10% is eight where you 10. should be starting. And, and if you're going away from eight to 10%, you should know why. Hmm. Interesting. Never thought of doing that. Um, well, most brewers understand the importance of pitching uh, the proper amount of yeast, but what are some of the other major control factors that come into play as we, you know, transition our, our, our beer into the fermenter and then, and then begin to ferment it? Well, certainly we, uh, there's so much information about yeast and you could talk for two hours just on, on yeast and, and how, how to get it, how to get the same strain to work the same way over and over again. I think uh, Vinny at Russian river has a great saying and, and that's ale yeast is like having a dog that's been trained to do a trick. <laughs> you can, as long as you know how to tell it to do that trick, you can get it to do that trick over and over and over again. And ale yeast are really forgiving that way. Um, uh, if you, it, they will behave if you give them the same input they will give you the same output every time and and that's wonderful and i love that about them uh -huh. um uh uh so so knowing what those parameters are you're you're making sure you have enough sterols in the in the yeast however you're doing that oxygen um, right 
Yeah, I like I like to pre-oxygenate wet yeast. Um, I don't I don't oxygenate the wort anymore. Interesting. Um, so, so how does so that how does that work? I'll uh, I'll do a starter and I'll oxygenate the as that starter pretty continuously with air, not with oxygen itself, but with air. And I'll just keep pumping air into that starter, um, then let it settle. Um, rack off the barm beer, the the beer that's on the top, mm-hmm. and I'll pour that yeast uh, directly in. And I I do that uh, about four hours before I'm ready to pitch. Wow. So so I'm I'm building those sterols right up until that moment I'm about to pitch. And you, um, you get enough oxygen in there during that early or enough sterols in it, I guess, during that 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 period. You must have a pretty and, big starter, I would assume. Yeah, that's so for five gallons I do a, a, a two liter starter and a four liter flask. Okay. Um, because I'm pitching a lot of that barm beer with it. I, I you don't get that hard settle that you get if you leave it overnight. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot Cell count wise, it's not a big starter. Um, it, it's probably the same as somebody who's doing a one liter starter, but um, uh, sterile wise, it's I think it's more consistent than oxygenating the wort, and I think it leaves less um, free oxygen in the wort to do bad things later. Hmm. Interesting. Um, what are some of the other factors that come into play? Obviously, you want to control your fermentation temperature. I assume temperature is super important, and. Uh, uh, that was another thing that that we didn't have any control of 20 years ago, and and all the beers tasted like it. And the the few guys that were doing great beers, Tasty McDole was doing great beers, um, Jimmy Zanishev was doing great beers, mm-hmm. Doc was doing great beers. Um, they all had control over their fermentation temperatures early and early before anybody else did. And mm-hmm. uh, um, I was when I learned to homebrew, I was learning to pro brew simultaneously, and so I knew that I had to have fermentation control and was able to build it early, early on into my home brewing system. And I can't imagine working without temperature control. Now it's so much easier. We have, we have glycol home, home glycol systems that are small, that they're not super affordable, but they're, they're not going to break the bank either. They're, they're cheaper than a car. Yeah. You know? yeah. Just barely. <laughs> Just barely. Well, <laughs> no, I'm joking. You know, I, I've yeah, seen them down. Home. I mean, seen them down in the thousand dollar range, I guess, but that's, Still not cheap, but but it, know, for some people four, affordable, you know. I think they're four or five hundred now. I, I haven't tracked right? one, but yeah. I think, I, to I be think honest, I haven't looked in a couple of years, but um, I think Amco's got some that are really uh, affordable now. Huh. Um, and then there's a variety of other systems. You use chilled water. You can use a you know you can use a fridge. Uh, there's a number of things you can you can do to control your temperature, obviously. So yeah, so my initial uh, fermentations were a carboy in a bucket of ice water with a, a, a T-shirt uh, over the carboy, and the T-shirt would wick up the, the water. It was a, you know, the big buckets that you put kegs in. The T-shirt would wick up the water, and I'd blow a fan across the, the fermentation. Yeah, I did and, wet towels, uh, which you have to change every couple hours, but uh, similar idea. Yeah. Yeah, right. The T-shirt wicked up better, which is why I went with the T-shirt. And <laughs> and and originally, I would just leave the fan on all the time. But later on, I I put a, a thermal well inside the carboy, and would turn the fan on and off with the with the beer temperature. Um, and that was a little bit more stable because um, in where I brew, where I brew in Napa, um, we get these cold foggy nights and these really hot days. Yeah. And uh, so trying to trying to even that out was an important thing. Um, but I only did that for about six months before I invented the the TEC controlled uh, uh, conicals for more beer. Mm-hmm. Um, and well, part of that development process was they gifted me one, um, and I used the same one all the way up until about a year and a half ago. Now, what do you do with your fermentation profile? I mean, do you uh, you do a, a, a rest? Do you do a, a cold crash? So I I love to ferment cold. Yeah. Um, uh, I, and I, I, I love to, to pitch cold, um, and ferment at the low end of the range. So let's, let's say I've decided that 68 to 72 tastes good with California ale yeast. Yeah. Um, I, I want to pitch at 68 and then I'll run two thirds of the gravity off at 68. And when about two thirds of the gravity is fermented off, I let it run away. I'll, I'll turn off the cooling or I'll set the cooling really hot, like set the cooling to 75 and uh, and let it run up. And the reason why I'm doing that is um, I find I'm getting a drier beer 
Mm-hmm. And I'm getting better yeast health at the end of fermentation. Mm-hmm. The two places I'm finding that yeast um, gives me bad things uh, are right at the beginning of fermentation, right at the end of fermentation. So I want to have really good control over that. Um, once it's running, it seems to be pretty happy. Um, right at the end, it says, oh, I don't have enough nutrition or I'm a little bit weak. Um, I'll see it throw off some off flavors. Or right at the beginning when when... Um, It hasn't gotten its pH under control. I see it throwing off some off flavors. Mm -hmm. So when you see that pH drop, you know, we talked about it in the beginning. You see that pH drop from your boil pH down to your to your beer pH. We see that happen before it's produced much alcohol. We see it really early on Mm -hmm. uh, in in the in the fermentation. And, And it really needs to do that slowly. If it tries to do that too fast, I find it'll generate off flavors. Um, well, a large amount of dry hops that we use these days in IPAs uh, comes with its own set of problems. Uh, what can we do to help uh, process control, you know, things like dry hopping? Well, certainly being consistent about what gravity you dry hop at is, is really important. We've we've seen lots of literature now about the bio uh, availability of yeast. Um, biotransformations, uh, yeah. Biotransformations, yeah. And, and how some of these molecules and hops are bioavailable and some aren't. We're still learning what varieties do what, at what temperatures, at what gravities. Um, I, I like to go in with about three Plato residual and get my hops in, uh, my first dry hop load there. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't let dry hops uh, be in contact with the beer for longer than 72 hours anymore. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I'm. Uh, homebrew level, I'm racking off my dry hops uh, after three days. Um, on the pro brew level, I'm taking them out of the cone. Um, and even though at a homebrew level, I'm dry hopping in a conical fermenter, um, I find I have to rack off to get a good separation. Interesting. Yeah. Um, anything else related to dry hopping? I mean, there's hop creep and all these other things going on as well. Well, one of the things I like about um, um getting some of that uh, hopping in while the yeast is still active. I think it helps me a little bit with hop creep. Yeah. Um, I'm still seeing hop creep at home and, and pro brewing um, uh, no matter what I do. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but that's not so hard for us that are serving beer really fresh because hop creep is kind of slow. Yeah, it is. But if, but if you've got a keg that's going to sit for a month, I don't carbonate it until I'm ready to serve it. Mm, that makes sense. Um, yeah, because, yeah, you know, yeah, the hop creep's going to dry out your beer, and it's going to be a little different than if you'd served it perfectly fresh, but at least it's not over-carbonating your beer, which I see happen to. Mm. Um, what about clarity? What do you do for beer clarity? So I'm a clear beer guy, and, and I yeah. love going and tasting hazy IPAs, and I really enjoy them. A well-crafted hazy IPA is one of my favorite, but boy, I, I like beers that are clear because I can taste the haze. Mm-hmm. Now, in the in a hazy IPA, you're actually using those flavors to your advantage. Right. Um, I think they distract from a West Coast IPA or from a, a pale ale or from an amber ale or a, a porter I, um, even a stout, I think they distract from the flavors. So I'm uh, I'm finding with silica, um, uh, which I, I find as a, a a very effective, quick finding agent. Um, I can settle a homebrew keg overnight uh, with mm-hmm. silica. So you talk about like the the silica gels and silica additives that are used to like winemaking, for example. Yeah, I use those a lot now. Um, I used to use just literally powdered silica. Interesting. Um, but it's super hard to get in suspension. Yeah. If you get it into suspension and get it injected well, um, it's great and cheap. <laughs> um, but it was adding a, an hour to every brew that I didn't want to take anymore. Well, let's talk about uh, carbonation packaging and, of course, uh, the evil of oxygen. <laughs> Well, so we, we kind of talked about oxygen all the way through. Yeah, this. we have. Yeah. Um, it's even more important after you have alcohol. Um, when, once you have alcohol, then then little tiny bits of oxygen are evil. And and a great example is I um, uh, was talking to a brewery that was having a packaging oxygen problems. Couldn't find it. Couldn't find it. Couldn't find it. It turned out they had a, a steel fitting um, coming out of their hot liquor tank. That steel fitting because our hot liquor tank um, uh, was running uh, uh, so little residual alkalinity 
they they didn't have any protective calcium on that fitting. That fitting was rusting and it was carrying um, uh, iron all the way into the package. Oh wow! And and um, that iron was holding on to oxygen. And even though you couldn't taste the metallic flavor of the iron, there wasn't enough. There was enough oxygen that it was staling their beer prematurely. Wow! And and obviously took months. Got that fitting. Got that uh, steel fitting out and. Uh, cleared up that uh, package oxygen problem so so yeah we're we're if you really want to store in the package for three months you really got to watch it all the way through especially these really light beers like a pale ale and then other uh, other concerns related to uh packaging uh, and beer process control um i i i like to obviously i i like to carbonate uh before i package um mm -hmm. because of my pro experience um, if you're if you're packaging by um, uh, add, uh, adding sugar in any way, whether that's guile or or dextrose or or uh, any other uh, wort I've, I've added, um, uh, any way you're adding sugar, um, you've got to really make sure that it's mixed, that, that you're really homogenous. I think uh, uh, one of my first mistakes I made um, uh, with uh, uh, carbonation was, um, trying to put sugar into a bucket full of beer and mixing it mm. and can't ever get it mixed. Um, what I learned right away is you put your sugar in a bucket and you rack on top of the sugar, only mm. way to get it mixed and, and, and trying to find a good way of mixing any, any sugar that you're adding um, is super important to consistency. Otherwise, uh, every bottle is a different carbonation level. Makes sense. Yeah. Um. Okay, are, are there any topics we may have missed uh, related to process control and uh, things that perhaps we can carry over from pro brewing to home brewing? Um, seeing it all as one process and really going, okay, I've got to get from A to Z today, and I've got to do it exactly the same as I did it yesterday. And and having that in your head and focus, that, that sense of clarity, that sense of purpose, Carrying that all the way through and executing a good beer is something that pro brewers do every day. Mm. And as a home brewer, you know, kind of have a few beers, you're working along, you something goes a little bit wrong, you go, eh, that's just part of the process. And 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 really what I'm saying is is maybe take it a little bit more seriously, maybe, maybe focus a little harder, treat it more like a job, and you'll actually see your beers improve. Um, you know, one topic we didn't cover was uh, ingredients. Obviously, uh, ingredients are organic things, and they vary from season to season. Um, is there anything you can do at the homebrew level to try and, uh, you know, mitigate uh, maybe hop, hop quality problems, malt quality problems, you know, changes in the supply chain, uh, and so on? Um, the maltsters are pretty good at making a consistent beer, a consistent malt under a consistent label. So if you go and buy great western two row um it's going to be really consistent all season long mm -hmm. then the next year they're going to take what they have and get as close as they can to those flavors um and we might see some brew house parameters that homebrewers don't really pay attention to right um change um that, that might affect pro brewers a lot. Like pro brewers might have to mash 15 minutes longer. They might have to um sort of put a rest in that they've never had to add before um, uh, because of poor quality malt. As home brewers, um, we can still do single infusion. And, and if we see a 2% a change in efficiency or if the filterability changes, we're not going to notice. Right, right. Um, what about things like hops? I know I, I personally have you know done the exercise you probably have too, where you open up a whole bunch of packages, hops and, Usually, there's at least one stinker in the in the pile, right? Um, you know, I, I I was taught to brew. One of the people that taught me to brew um, uh, ran a produce department before he learned to brew, mm -hmm. and we used to talk a lot about how these these products would change a lot. And one of the things he taught me is your best loss is the first loss. If if you've got a bad banana sitting in a in a rack full of bananas. Um, customer is going to walk by and they're going to look at it and say, Ooh, that banana is bad. I don't think I'm going to have bananas today. I'm going to go have apples. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and you really need to take that mentality into your hops. If you open a bag of hops and you don't like it, throw them away. Yeah. I always um, encourage people to do that before they start brewing. 
because uh, <laughs> you never know what I, you're going to get. I, absolutely. And especially when you look at these little packages, you know, these little four ounce packages, um, a lot harder to get quality control in them. Yeah. Um, you know, they're uh, obviously they're they're breaking up a 44 pound brick. Um, and, and the beginning of that run might taste different than the end of that run. Right. Um, so the, so uh, home brewers have a lot more of a challenge. I think the, uh, pro brewers, you know, might use that 44 pound brick in a, in a few weeks time, mm -hmm. whereas home brewers, um, you know, so the pro brewers probably getting it from a zero degree storage facility, whether that's on their property or, or a brewer supply group or whoever's holding their hop contract, um, and, and using it all within a month. Right. Um, where, whereas a, um, a home brewer, that uh, hop has seen a lot uh, more adverse storage conditions. Right. And, and really have extras around. Keep them in your freezer. Throw them away if you don't like them. Um, I chew malt. I, so I, I taste my water before I brew. I chew my malt before I brew. I, I do a hop rubbing, you know, break up a pellet, rub it in my in my hands and give it a good smell before I brew. Mm -hmm. um, uh uh, same with the yeast. If I'm using wet yeast, I give it a good smell before I brew. Um, uh, I'm more and more at the homebrew level. I'm using dry yeast. Um, as I can get more and more strains that I like, I'm converting to dry yeast from wet yeast. Um, the, the, they're so good at packaging dry yeast now with sterols. Um, yeah, I mean, it can be you know, stored for such a long time too, which is great. And, and I'm not adding any oxygen. I'm just going straight out of the package with no oxygen, sprinkle it on the top and getting really consistent ferments, hmm. really consistent, clean ferments. Um, well, Colin, your closing thoughts on uh, process control for the home brewer. You know, it sounds like a lot in the beginning. And, and if you look at my original articles for BYO, I was starting in about 98, 99, um, uh, one of the things that you'll notice is everything I look at, I take it all the way from how does this affect my hot liquor tank to how does it affect my finished beer? And I look at it every step of the way. Um, uh, uh, if I'm looking for clarity, I look through every step of the way. If I'm looking for for clean fermentations of high gravity, I look at it every step of the process and just think about every parameter that you're trying to control. Think about how every step in the process controls it, and the whole process will start to come together in your mind. Um, I think the German word I, I like to use is gestalt. That whole <laughs> once pr process becomes a gestalt uh, in your being. Uh, you will find that you can make better, more consistent beers. Well, Colin, uh, really appreciate you coming on the show today, and thank you for uh, for sharing your professional brewing knowledge with uh, with some of us home brewers. Uh, thanks again. You know, thank you for having me, Brad. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, my guest today was Colin Kaminsky, a co-author of Water, a comprehensive guide for brewers, as well as uh, many BY articles, and of course, he works uh, on the pro brewing side at More Beer. Uh, thank you again, Colin. Really appreciate you being here. It was my pleasure. Have a great day. A big thank you to Colin Kaminsky for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. If you want to start your own brewery, join them in Colorado for their brewery workshop, where you can connect with the experts who have built successful breweries. To sign up, go to breweryworkshop.com. Again, that's breweryworkshop.com. And also the Brew Commander, the brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent pending Brew Commander is a high quality brew house controller that offers automated step mashing, oil timers, precision temperature control, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with the new Brew Commander. To order yours today, visit BlickmanEngineering.com. And I launched a new version of the Beersmith Forum a few weeks ago, as well as made some significant security upgrades. The Beersmith Discussion Forum is a place where you can discuss all things brewing, including techniques, ingredients, equipment, pro brewing, and our Beersmith recipe software. Join in the conversation today at beersmith.com slash forum. Again, that's beersmith.com slash forum. I'd like to thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm -hmm.